how many of you, and I can't see you because they got these bright lights on us, but how many of you ever had an anxious moment in your life? Raise your hand. How many of you wish you could like, sometimes you get anxious because you see the way the world is around you and you wish you could change it? Yeah, like everybody. So me too. Um, I'm going to tell you a, a quick little story and, and talk to you about uh, the way I felt like uh, a group of young warriors and myself became kind of forces of nature in our business, but I think it's applicable to really anything in life. You know, the first thing, and I'm missing my first slide after this one, I think. I'm going to pull it up. Actually, I don't have any slides. Um, this will be cool. Okay, I do have slides. I'll get to that one in just a minute. Um, this slide's supposed to say the pursuit of joy on it. Um, so 1966. I'm in, uh, I'm eight years old, living in a little town of Murfreesboro, North Carolina. I've got my transistor radio, earplug in, nothing but AM stations on it. I'm trying to find the Wake Forest Demon Deacons. My, both of my parents went to Wake Forest on the radio, four hours east of Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And all I can get is a school in Raleigh and a school in Chapel Hill that shall go unnamed. And I, and I like literally, we live on a farm. I walk out into the pasture. Then I walk up to the higher ground where the cornfield is. Then I come to the backyard where the oak tree is. 25 feet off the ground is the tree house that my brothers and my dad and I built. I climb 25 feet higher in the oak tree and I still can't get the Wake Forest basketball game, football game on the radio. So I learned early on, ask for help. I, I went to see Santa Claus, Thanksgiving that, that fall. I asked him for a world band radio so I could listen to my beloved Demon Deacons on the radio. I got my world band radio on Christmas Day, and after that I became a Boston Red Sox fan. I could listen to Wake Forest games. I could get all these stations, and I knew that I was addicted at that point to sports. I knew that this would be part of the calling in my life, and I'm going to talk about that calling in just a little bit. By the way, it's so funny. They've got this timer here. You can talk from 13 to 18 minutes. Everybody who set this conference up that's heard me speak before said, there's no way you'll hit it. I'm going to. Um, so so the, the, the first thing I learned, my first lesson, pursuit of joy. Isn't that a great slide? I, tell, I told my children from an early age, you know, pursue in life, only a few things will inspire passion and joy. Pursue only those things. I really and truly believe that. And if you do it, I believe you can become a force of nature because you're in something, you're in love with whatever it is that you're, that you're chasing. So DBA, a great legal term. I went to Wake Forest Law School. It means doing business as. Um, for me, and I always thought that was kind of cool, you know, people would incorporate a company and it would be Ben Sutton Incorporated doing business as Vincenzo's Restaurant or whatever the business was. Um, for me, doing business as meant also dreaming, believing, and achieving. I really, really, really was taught from a young age by my parents to dream really big dreams. We grew up quite poor on a farm in eastern North Carolina that we didn't own, for the most part in rental homes that we didn't own. And my parents instilled in all of us the belief that if you could dream it, you could do it, kind of the Walt Disney mantra. I believe that early. I believe it 61 years later um, because I believe in me. And, and so I would always, I would challenge our team, you know, if you can find people who share your dream and you believe in yourself and you can find others who have the same belief in that dream, you can achieve unbelievable things. Jim Collins, the writer of Good to Great, calls them big, hairy, audacious goals, be hags. And, and I'm a big fan of big, hairy, audacious goals. Um, you've got to have shared values. Shared values with the people that you align with every single day is maybe the most important thing in the world. For us, in our world, in, the, in, our, in our sports marketing uh, background, the people that I worked with, I cared about character and integrity, work ethic, passion, family. These were the values that bound us together. But we were also bound by, again, to call on Mr. Collins' treatise in Good to Great, that good is the absolute mortal lethal enemy of great. 
and I really and truly believe that. The having passion around your purchase, uh, purpose, I think, is really important. So, going back to that little kid on the farm, I thought when I was listening to all those games that I would be the next Carl Yastrzemski or Johnny Unitas. I listened to Baltimore Colts, uh, Boston Red Sox, those were my two professional idols, and then the Wake Forest Demon Deacons. Well, what I learned early on is that being the actual athlete was probably not in my future. I mean, look at me, <laughs> right? Nobody's going, ooh, that guy can play. Um, in fact, I'll, get, I'll tell you a great story. I came up here to football camp in 1971, 13 years old. Cal Stoll was the head football coach, went on to coach at Minnesota. I came, I had what I thought was a great week. 13 years old, I'm going to be the high school quarterback. I'm in camp all week long, and a guy named Oval James, who coached with Pat Dye, went on to become an athletic director at three different uh, major uh, NCAA institutions. He looked at me, and, he, and he, I probably was, you know, 5'8 and weighed 108 pounds. And he said, son, I hope you're smart as hell because you got no future as a football player. <laughs> And I'm like, I saved up all year long to, 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 you know, to put together $65 so I could come up here to camp because that's how much it cost back then. But I knew that I was still passionate about sports and that th this is really something uh, that I wanted to be, I wanted to make a, a, a large part of my life. Even as a youngster, I understood how important sports were to the fabric of the United States of America. So, so, so that burning passion inside of me uh, was, was always there. And frankly, when we talk about a couple of other slides that are coming up, I'll share with you why it was important to have that shared passion with others. Because in building a company, Jim Collins and Jerry Porce, it sounds like these are the only books I read, wrote a book called uh, Built to Last. And they talk about cult-like cultures. You have to have in alignment with you, if you want to be a force of nature, you've got to permeate. It's like throwing a pebble out into a, a still pond and creating ripples. You need teammates. I'm all for individualism, and I am absolutely against collectivism, but I am totally for teamwork. And, and so you've got to have people that pull into that same goal in whatever uh, venue in which you work uh, is, you've got to have people that really believe almost in a cult-like way in your cause. They've got to be fanatically, fanatically devoted to what you believe, what they believe, and frankly, um, whoops, there we go, help you build community through deeply personal, meaningful relationships. Everybody that ever talks to me says, how did y'all build from a little $700,000 company in 1992 with one school. How did you build four national market leading companies, a billion dollar enterprise in 20 years, four national market leading companies, a thousand employees, 105 offices in 42 states, how did you do it? One simple word, people, people. Building a great sense of community, developing relationships with people where you have each other's backs, you lift others up on the days that they're down. They lift you up on the days that you're down. We all have ebbs and flows. One of the things that I used to talk about with our team at ISP and IMG, and now I do in our, in our various companies, we have five portfolio companies at Till Capital, is being a church of second chances. Nothing galls me more than when a politician, a college administrator, the president of a Fortune 500 company, a student athlete makes a mistake and everybody says, and I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about like a committing a felony. They make mistakes. Be a church of second chances. But in our society, everybody goes, they got to go. You got to fire them. Well, then they, I mean, what's the point of that? I mean, that's kind of like saying I'm envi an environmentalist and I own a home down on the coast, but I don't want any windmill turbines out there two miles off the coast that I can say, I, see, I want them somewhere else. I just want to make it somebody else's problem. Why not go in and create a little healing space and be in a church of second chances, practicing, uh, you know, the mantra of forgiveness. So in our place, that was really a huge part of our culture. 
And if you want to build that coal-like culture, then you, have, you better have people who are all in for each other and understand that every single day we're going to trip up, we're going to fall, we're going to fail, and somebody's going to lift us up. Now, if we become habitual, then you go back to that cult-like culture and you say, we've got to prune this person from the tree. But one mistake, I don't get that. Change that in America. Be a force of nature for that change. Have a sense of urgency. I have no better testimony about chasing your dream and becoming a force of nature and changing an entire paradigm. In our case, it was to change the entire college sports marketing industry. I mean, I really kind of, at this point, at 61 years old, <laughs> I don't need to read stuff where people say, oh, this guy invented the way the sports you know, media world operates in college sports. We had an amazing team. It was all of us together saying the way sports are marketing and, marketed and sold around college is just not right. Our competition is the NFL. We can do better. Let's go out there and build a better paradigm, and let's change an industry for the better. But it was everybody. But we had to have enormous sense of urgency about it because the NFL existed for 100 years before we opened shop, and ESPN existed for 20. Our three primary competitors were all 25 years old or older by the time we came in. So if we were going to warrior up with those people, we needed to have great urgency. Zig Ziglar said, time is so precious, I dare not waste a moment of it. It's one of my favorite sayings of all time. My brother in 1992, my, I'm the oldest of six kids, found out that he had leukemia. I was with him at Emory Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. At that point, he had a 13-year-old daughter and a 10-year-old daughter. And I was with him when the doctor delivered that devastating news. And I will never forget, after a few tears and a lot of hugs and just about 30 minutes of just trying to process that information, I will never forget him looking at me and saying, I'm going to fight like hell to beat it, but I can tell you this, whether I've got four to six months like he said, whether I've got three years, whether I've got 33 years, I'm going to live every single moment of the rest of my life with so much urgency and such a sense of, of purpose, you're going to be blown away. He lived for 32 months, and he did that in everything that he did. I mean, literally every day, he was tackling some bucket list item. And I loved being around that. If I didn't understand sense of urgency before that, I understood it watching my brother's courageous fight against cancer. So you better have a sense of urgency about what you're doing, or somebody will come into whatever space you're in, and they will lap you. This next one, the magic concept. Uh, my favorite philosopher, how many of you know the show Seinfeld? My favorite philosopher, the great Cosmo Kramer, right? <laughs> be the master of your own domain. The best way to do that is to be the best you can possibly be. I mean, Coach Wooden and others called it, you know, make every day your masterpiece, but literally every day, wake up and think about something that you can do that creates some diametrical or, or, or great change, incremental or exponential change in the world. Be better than you are today, tomorrow. Be accountable and hold other people accountable. If it's your idea and you're at the top of the ship, make sure that people are all pulling in the same direction. As I said, I don't believe in collectivism. Everybody needs to pull their weight. Be gracious. Say please, say thank you. We had a tangible way at our shop. Every single employee that came in to our shop, we gave them engraved cards with their name on them. And every Friday morning, we had something called Right Time, W-R-I-T-E. I really don't actually remember what it stood for. Um, but we asked people to write 10 handwritten thank you notes every single Friday to clients, to people they'd called on that week, to their wives, to their sons, their daughters, but just to show they really cared. So practice gratitude in everything you did. do. Be inclusive. Um, you know, this word today is like a lot of other words, disruptive and other things. It's like, it's almost overused. I grew up in a town that was 75% African American and 25% white. My two best friends my freshman year at Wake Forest were a black guy 
who ran on the football team and is still maybe the greatest running back in the history of Wake Forest football and a Lumbee Indian from Lumberton, North Carolina. We hung out in the gym every single day. I've got a brother who's proudly gay. I was just saying to somebody backstage moments ago, I, I really believe, and maybe it's an age thing. I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. As I've gone through life, I find that more and more I don't notice like anything about anybody except what they're saying and what I think is coming out of their heart. And I just think that's, a, that's kind of a great way. I mean, we were in a melting pot business. You know, I mean, there's nothing like sports to create a melting pot, and that's what America's supposed to be. But be inclusive, be open-minded, be open to other ideas. I love listening to the last presentation today um, and kind of thinking about racism and combating racism and thinking about it in a very rhythmic, uh, rhythmic bodily way. Be curious. I say to people all the time, the I'll take a curious person over an intelligent person anytime, a person that reads deeply from, from, from great books and wants to learn every day and kind of going back to being masterful. I think that's a, that's a, great, uh, a, a great attribute. And lastly, hashtag America. My daughter taught me this because I'm not cool enough at 61 to know stuff like this. What happened for me? What happened for my family? What happened to my teammates and our company could only have happened in the United States of America. Couldn't have happened in any other country in the world. We have our challenges in America, there is no doubt. But I'm on the Olympic Committee, I work with uh, lots of different interests that require me uh, to travel really around the world. And I will tell you that the United States of America is still the envy of every country in the world. There's literally no person anywhere that I meet that doesn't want to be an American. So I really, I believe in capitalism. I love listening to Professor Otteson today talking about the morality of business. I happen to believe that capitalism is the only moral form of economy. And, and I believe it will withstand time. And so I'm, I'm big on America. And I believe that as an entrepreneur, as a change agent in my case, a lot of people are called to be ministers and they say, I felt it on my heart. My calling was to create jobs and opportunity and uphold the American ideal. I, believe, I actually believe what we do is patriotic. And I think if you're a force for nature for anything in our country, you're buying into my hashtag. Thank you for being here today. I double dare you to get out there and be a force of nature and change the world.